Let's talk about uh, state machines, which go by different names. Sometimes you'll hear these being called uh, state diagrams or uh, finite state machines. But they're really fundamental, I think, to modeling the behavior, the temporal behavior of, of things, pretty much anything. So this is one that's you can find in Wikipedia if you search on finite state machine, you'll find a, an entry. And what's going on here is you've got this little black circle right here. This is meant to indicate the initial state. Um, and there is no final state. You can either be in the locked or unlocked position. So you kind of have to remember uh, turnstiles. And what's somewhat sort of humorous is that this is a coin-operated turnstile, whereas, uh, you know, I haven't seen one of those in ages, right? It's usually a card of some sort, right? A paper card or plastic card or something, and <clears throat> that's how you get through a turnstile. But the idea is it's, a, it's, a lo it's locked until you provide it with authentication. And for the coin-operated ones, which were some of the early first 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 ones available in terms of turnstiles, you just dropped a coin in, or you dropped the right amount of coins in. Just like you might do with a vending machine. Okay, so this is the this is the thing we're talking about, and this is a model, a finite state machine or a state diagram model of this the behavior of, of this at a particular level, right? So you start and it's locked and you put a coin in, which means we go along this arrow right here and then it becomes unlocked. Um, and again, another humorous thing about this is you can put a lot of other coins in if you wish and it will just accept them gladly, right? And so, and you'll just stay in the unlocked states. So I think this is kind of interesting. If you push the turnstile, which means you put your body and you push against one of these bars, then uh, it goes back to the lock state. And of course, um, if you push while it's in lock state, it's just going to be locked, right? And that's all this means right here. So what you've got in a, in a state diagram is you've got two things. You've got states, which are represented as circles and you've got transitions, which are represented as arrows. And so that's pretty much what a finite state machine is. It's a whole bunch of circles representing states and then arrows, which represent ways to get from one state to another. Uh, sometimes call, you know, you're transitioning from one state to another. This is some history. It's a little boring, I suppose, but if you want to get the history of finite state machines, you have to go back to Alan Turing's paper in the mid-30s where he covers an aspect of computability. That's the nature of the, of the paper. However, in doing so, he creates a virtual machine. And I think what's interesting is not just the fact that, you know, the, the paper is interesting and it's a theoretical interest to, to computer science. But the fact is he took something mathematical and he called it a machine. And we take that for granted today. People say, oh, you know, finite state machine, finite state automata. But the fact is um, I'm not aware of a, a precedent to this before Turing, where somebody took something mathematical and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to call this a machine. So I just think that's sort of an interesting metaphor or analogy. So yes, with Turing's paper, a mathematical object, the finest A machine, became a machine in terms of, uh, in, in English. And uh, obviously I don't know how to spell, you know, this is a finite number of states, so I should fix that. Of course, there's no, no time better than the present to fix it, right? There you go. I'm going to fix it. Fixed. 
Now, um, this is a bit more theoretical, the last two bullets. In computer science, chances are you learned about state machines in one of three places. Either in a kind of theory course, like dis discrete math or automata theory, you learned about it there. You learned about it when you took, if you took a circuit class and you needed to construct finite state machines before you built the circuit. <clears throat> and the third place you may have encountered it is in software engineering. For example, unified modeling language, which we'll get to in another series of lectures. Uh, it is, it is not, if I find a state machine not, not, not Turing complete, and I think a good way of just thinking about what this means is the finite state machine in its raw incarnation, in its basic representation, um, can't do what other computer programming languages can do. However, it's very simple to make an FSM pretty much do anything you can do in Python or Java or C++. And all you do to make this happen is you extend or augment the FSM, especially with the ability to, to perform read-write memory access. In other words, you, you allow multiple variables of different names, you know, X or, uh, you know, a, a more readable variable name, and then you have values. And so you have the ability to, to write to memory and to read from memory without restricting memory um, in, in, in any particular way like the Turing machine does. So all this goes to show right here is that yes it's interesting that a mathematical object became a machine. That's kind of the linguistic um, result of, of Turing's paper. And the other is that with some really minor modifications the, the state diagram or state machine can be as powerful as anything else that we have in computing and programming. So here's some examples. Uh, life, cycle, life cycle is a, a, of a, a monarch butterfly. And you've probably seen these around, right? Very interesting. Uh, you start, there's an egg phase, then the caterpillar phase. So whenever we, anyone ever uses the word phase or stage, you can think of state, right? It's a condition in which something exists. And after caterpillar, there's a chrysalis, and the chrysalis opens up, and an adult butterfly emerges, and here's the adult phase, you know, without the, um, the chrysalis wrapping. And so um, you probably have seen this sort of life cycle for, for you know, many different kinds of living things. And you may have, you, you know, you may know examples of ecosystem life cycles and so on. All, all these are essentially just examples of finite state machines. In terms of animation and games, we'll start with something that could be considered part of a game or part of an animation. Um, let's imagine that you've got a, a human, some, somebody that's ducking, standing, jumping, or diving. I mean. Those are the only four states, let, we'll just say, that the human is engaged in in some part of a game or some part of an animated flick, right? They're in one of those four states. They get out of that by, um, uh, by avatar, avatar control. So, you know, you're, you've got a controller, like an Xbox or a PlayStation controller or something, and you press buttons, and depending on what you press, you can go from one state to another. Now, uh, text-based sort of adventure games and map-based games, uh, this is an example from way back, um, kind of late 70s, early 80s, Zork 1, where you, as I recall, you're sort of outside of a house next to a mailbox and you have to interact with the mailbox, which takes certain events and those events take you from one state to another where a state in Zork 1 is the physical location, the area in which you happen to be. If you're like outside the mailbox, 
near the mailbox, that's a state. If you're in the house, that's another state. If you're on the front lawn, that's another state, right? And so these are just examples from, from animation and, and games. Uh, sometimes you you know you won't hear the you may you may not hear state diagram or find a state machine so you kind of have to be on the lookout um, because they're again to repeat they're kind of much everywhere right and it's just a matter of perspective <clears throat> in terms of uh, UX design where UX stands for user experience everything you do with your cell phone. You may be using your cell phone right now to check up on something or read a message or you know text message somebody. Basically, the the whole dynamic interaction, the whole process of you using the the phone is a state machine, identified by states being what you see on the screen, and the transitions, the arrows coming out, uh, what you touched, what you interacted with what gesture you used. You will follow a, an arc, an arrow coming out. Just a fine, again, another fine estate machine. So if somebody would ask you, you know, gosh, how are, how's a, what's the connection between a life cycle of a monarch butterfly, early adventure games, and, and UX design on cell phones? You now know the answer is state machines, right? They, essentially that's the abstract model that captures the dynamics. In hypertext, uh, we use this all the time. You click on text, or you might click on an image. Uh, some of the earlier images that I had, including this one actually, I think, are hypertext. So you can click on this image and, and it's at hypertext. So you can think of hypertext as a kind of state machine, which is you're in one state, which is to say you're you're, you're in a home page, right? And then you click on a link right here, and it ta this takes you to another home page or another page. So it's actually, in a way, you know, hypertext is, is sort of very similar in principle to UX flow design, in that you, you have some sort of presentation in front of you, you click on something that's a transition from one state to another state, i.e., one page to another page and you move forward. So these are just popular examples of where you know the the dynamics, the behavior of something is described as an FSM. Now this is kind of freeform exploration and is something that you know it, it is I'd like you to, to think about as you kind of look around your apartment or, uh, you know, if you look around when you're taking a walk outside. All right, where are the finite state machines here? Well, the first thing to know to finite state machines is it depends on the scope. So, you know, there's a, there's a state machine for the spoon over here, the wooden spoon. There's a state machine for the cup. There's a state machine for the copy within the cup. There might be a state machine defining this pattern over time. Um, you know, when the barista makes this wonderful concoction for you, let's say a latte, you have this right here, but it doesn't stay long because you start sipping it and that creates a mixing of fluids and you no longer have this pretty pattern. So you might say, you know, hey, the, the pattern on the top is a state machine. It's in one of, let's say, two states. One, the first state is it looks like this. That's the original state. And the second state is a mixed state when it doesn't look like that. And you know, if you think about how patterns emerge, you might even find more than two states in defining the behavior of this pattern over time. And of course, you know, you could just talk about temperature. You know, this, something starts out being particularly hot. It's hopefully you know, this is hot latte. And then it gets colder over time, so you can have multiple states reflective of the current temperature of the coffee. <clears throat> so it kind of depends, the state machine you're developing depends on the scope of what, you know, we're we talking about the table and the spoon and the saucer 
and the coffee cup and the, you know, are we talking about everything? Or are we just talking about, say, the pattern on the latte? And, and so that's something to, to sort of think about. <clears throat> the other thing to think about is that you can dive, an aug a natural augmentation of finest day machines is to say, you can take a state you can zoom into it, you can go inside of it and find another finite state machine. Or indeed a computer program in Python. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that ability is, um, is kind of a hierarchy. So things like scope and hierarchy play a big role on trying to find finite state machines around us. This is a trebuchet, an early medieval uh, siege engine for castles to, you know, uh, and trebuchets were really big before the age of um, artillery, right? And you, you probably, you may have seen models of trebuchets that, you know, scale down models. But, you know, if you have to think about this, what would be, what could be a fine estate machine? Well, there's a whole ton, right? I mean, of course, there's people over here. Maybe there's a fine estate machine. They're talking to each other and then you know that's one state. Another state is they're they're leaving, or they're or they're coming closer to the trebuchet or moving away from it. So you have to sort of put your imagination loose on every aspect of this photograph. But clearly the focal point is this this machine. And we could say well it's in this state, and this state is a kind of loose state. So it's not. This is kind of like a static state for the. Um, for the trebuchet. Another state is it's it's armed, uh, which is to say that this lever right here, this arm, is pulled down, and then this this weight, there's a bunch of rocks and stuff in here, they end up resting upon this flat area right down here at the bottom of the trebuchet. So when it's armed, you know, just like you might arm an alarm in your in your apartment or in your house, uh, that's a different state. And of course, when it's released, that's an action, that's a transition that takes you from armed to the, uh, the throwing state. And of course, you could go into, you know, well, there's a state where you've got the, whatever's in here, a ball, a metal ball or rocks or something, when they're released. And so when you kind of look at this photograph, I, I want you to sort of, Spend some time attending to it, you know, whether it's this or, you know, the latte that I showed last, and think about, okay, what, you know, what's the scope? And, you know, are we dealing with the people? Are we dealing with the grass? Are we dealing with the trebuchet? And what states might we have? So I think this, <clears throat> in, my, in my way of thinking, this is the fun part of finite state machines and state diagrams is, we're not even talking about the mathematical notation. We're not talking about the formalism, right? We're not drawing circles and arrows and stuff. We're just engaged in discourse around the object, imagining what states the trebuchet might be in. And then um, once we identify the states, what are transitions that take us from one state out of that state into another? So, uh, you know, in terms of state machines, that's kind of like, this is the, this is the, this is ground zero. This is where you want to begin the conversation. And of course, uh, is this one finite state machine representing the whole group of five kids and an adult? Or does each kid have his, uh, their own finite state machine defining what they're doing? Uh, and so you sort of get into questions like that for these skiers. Same thing with if you're making toast, right? What are, what are, what are the... the uh, and one thing you can do with machines. So this is an example of, a, of what you would actually call a real machine, right? And <clears throat> it's in your kitchen. Is you can take a look at the interactions like you do on your, on your cell phone. You know, what buttons can you press? Those are inputs, those are events. Those events will cause a change of state. Same thing with the, uh, the, these two things right here, which are probably 
uh, the amount of browning that you want on your toast. If you want uh, just a little bit of toasty, you go with one. If you want it very dark, then you go to five. And I'm guessing on this Breville machine that this probably operates these two heaters and this probably operates these two. But this is a fairly complicated final state machine. If you had to draw it out and think about, okay, what are all the states? It actually can get quite complicated or it can be simple. It depends on what you want, right?